Our first speaker is Rick Debus, who has been for many years an expert in bringing mutagenesis to PS2, in particular oxygen evolution, and uh, today is going to bring isotopes and FTIR to see if he can track water moving around there. Rick. Thanks, Les, and I want to thank Jim for inviting me. It's my first trip to Singapore. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed the meeting, and I also enjoy the green foliage, having been grown up and living in the California desert. <laughs> so we're trying to, <coughs> what we are interested in is probing the networks of hydrogen bonds near the manganese cluster, because we'd like to know how the protons egress, what the pathways are, and we're also looking at substrate water molecules. And our main tool is FTIR different spectroscopy. We use FTIR because this is a technique that's exquisitely sensitive to structural changes that take place during an enzyme catalytic cycle. It's very sensitive to things like changes in bonding, interactions, particularly changes in hydrogen bondings. It's very good for looking at changes in PKAs, polypeptide backbone conformation, and so on. The difficulty when you apply it to something as large as photosystem two is every functional group absorbs. And so what you look at when you take a spectrum, say, the mid-frequency region of, say, the ground S1 state, the dark stable state, is this amorphous blob. There's simply too much information. It's dominated by peptide leakages. So what we do is we take a different spectrum. Say you're in the poison S1 state, you give a flash to the S2 state, and you take the difference. If it's done right, every functional group that doesn't change cancels out, and what you are left with are specific changes. These blue peaks show um, where functional groups were absorbing in the S1 state and the red where they moved to in the S2 state. And these are extremely small changes. This is 10 to the minus 4 OD units on top of an absorption of 1, and those are like the largest things we look at. We're actually looking at things down almost 5 times 10 to the minus 6 now. So very small signals. And we also look at if you take the difference without a flash, that gives us an estimate of of the background. Now, <clears throat> what we do in preparing samples is something Takumi Gucci worked out back in 2002. And the problem we have is in the mid-frequency region right through here and in the high-frequency region there is you have excess water have very strong absorption. So what we do is we partly dry the samples onto, say, calcium chloride or barium chloride window. But then we rehydrate under very controlled conditions by spotting around the sample in a sealed cell, droplets, say, 20% glycerol or 40% glycerol, because 20% glycerol will give you an atmosphere of 99% relative humidity. 95% uh, or 40% glycerol gives you 95% relative humidity. And this cuts down dramatically the excess water peak, so you can put more sample on the window. If you have relative humidity of 95% or more, you can cycle through the S-state cycle here. You can flash and you see the different spectrum. This technique also gives us a very simple way of isotopically labeling weakly bound water, i.e. water molecules in the hydrogen bond network, so we can replace it with D2O or O18 water and so on, simply put by putting droplets of isotopically labeled water here. Now, the peaks here, um, you see many of these peaks uh, oscillate, period of four. Again, this is first seen by Takumi Noguchi. Um, when we first started this work back about 25 years ago, we thought that these peaks would all be coming from the ligands. And in fact, the first work uh, we did in my own laboratory was to identify the C-terminus of the D1 polypeptide, at, uh, alanine 344. We could see the functional, the actual uh, symmetric carboxylate vibrations of that carboxylate by labeling samples with C13 alanine. And so we thought, oh, great, that's super. We can see those peaks. Now we should be able to see the peaks corresponding to, say, uh, D170 or blue 89 and so on. But what we found, much to our surprise, is four of the carboxylate ligands of the manganese cluster, now that we you know, have structure, don't have it cause any change in the spectrum. This is quite a shock. And let me show you an example of that. So this is Sparte 170 changed to histidine, and there are no main changes at all, <laughs> despite the fact that in the structures now, Sparte 170 but bridges between manganese and calcium. And in fact, two years ago, Takumi Noguchi published a QMM-MM analysis 
and predicted that, in fact, all these peaks would be coming from the ligands and said that, in fact, the symmetric carboxylate stretching mode of D170 would be around 1400 in the S1 state and um, up here in the S2 state. Well, we don't see that. Uh, in fact, we don't see it for any of these. And, that, and, and, the, and it actually gets more interesting than that because you have this bridging carboxylate group. You change it to histidine. Half the centers assemble clusters, but they seem to be perfectly normal in all the assays we do, whether it be pulse DPR or FTIR, with an exception I'll show you in a minute. Glutamate 189, it's a ligand. But if you put lysine or arginine there, or glutamine, we worked with Joachim Junga on this uh, about 20 years ago and found, despite the fact you changed glutamate to lysine or arginine, the electron transfer rates the reduction of the manganese cluster and YZ dot are effectively unchanged. So um, that's all weird. Um, and so I've often asked, are you sure you're looking at mutants? Um, and so I answer that this way. First, we grow 21 liters of cells for every prep, and we take 50 mils of those cells and harvest the DNA and sequence it to be sure it's the right mutant. There have been a couple of times we found we purified the wrong mutant. Um, so it's the right mutant, it hasn't um, uh, reverted, so yes. But also there are changes. For example, aspartate 170, they said there's no change in the mid-frequency region, but if you look at the low-frequency region, there's a peak at 606 wave numbers. That was first observed by uh, Babcock and Chu back uh, in the late 1990s, which is coming from a, a manganese oxygen manganese part of the manganese cluster, and it shifts in this mutant. So mutation does actually have some spectroscopic signature, and that's also true for E189Q. Ono found the same mode is shifted in E189Q. And also, if you look at the rate of oxygen, the light side of rate of oxygen of the mutant cells, mutations D69N, D342N rather, E333Q, they're highly perturbed. So I'd say, yes, we have the mutants. And in fact, the, the, what we see, this forest of peaks that are, you see in the FTR spectrum are not coming from the ligands. They're coming from outside. Because when we make mutations in the second coordination shell, some of these are shown here. There are many others. You see lots of changes in the spectrum. Okay. And so some of these are actually far more perturbed than mutations of the ligands what we're looking at, say, D61 or mutation down here, the such saturates on about 20%. Now, when making these mutations, and we have more than are shown here, we see some of the very same spectral changes. So let me just show some of them. So in this region is where you have the overlapping AMI2 asymmetric carboxylate stretching region. If you see this little peak right there, that is a asymmetric carboxylate stretch. We know that from isotopic labeling, and that's diminished. It's diminished in many mutants. Uh, if you look at these features here, this negative peak of 1544, and you have this uh, derivative shape there, they're diminished or eliminated in many mutants. Uh, this peak right there is a mixture of Mi2 and asymmetric carboxylate. It's diminished. Incidentally, this doesn't look very focused. Is there some way of focusing the projector? Um, and they're changed in the asymmetric, in the symmetric carboxylate stretching mode here, and there, and there. Here's another mutant, which again shows some of the very similar changes. So we see many of the same changes and mutations made all over this region. And so we think that, in fact, what we're seeing in the S2 minus S1 spectrum is the response of the protein environment to the charge that develops on the manganese cluster during the S1 to S2 transition. And what we're seeing is these amino acid residues are all coupled in the hydrogen bonding network. So if you start making mutations in that network, you see some of the same changes, despite the fact you make a mutation you know, 10 angstroms apart. OK, but well, let me focus on a particular vibrational frequency. And I'm going to show, by example, glutamate 329. We made the 329 glutamine mutation about 20 years ago. It had no effect on auction rate. So we put the, freeze, it put the mutation in the freezer. Forgot about it for about 20 years uh, until we realized that the functional groups, uh, mutations out here, are what causing changes in the spectrum. But when we look at the spectrum of that mutant, nothing changes except right there. This negative peak in the wild type is vanished. 
and also in the S3 minus S2 spectrum. This is where you see carbonyl stretches. And in fact, if you look at the peak in the wild type, in the S1 to S2 transition, the wild type, you see a negative peak. It shifts four wave numbers in D12. In the S3 to minus S2 spectrum, you have a positive peak, which is about a one or two wave number shifted from the earlier spectrum. It shifted seven wave numbers, and so on. Well, that D2O and new new shift shows that these features are from a protonated carboxylate group. And the fact that this is negative means during the S1 to S2 transition, a carboxylate group's pKa value decreases in response to the charge building up in the cluster. And there's another carboxylate group whose pKa increases in response to the structural changes during the S2 to S3 transition. These reverse during the S3 minus S2 transition because this is a much larger feature than that one. You see only uh, basically this reversed here. There seems to be another carboxylate whose environment shifts or changes during the S0 to S1 transition. It's a weak signal and, and, and it shifts. The interesting thing is this peak didn't just disappear in this E329Q mutant. It disappeared in a large number of mutants or it's diminished in others. It's also diminished if you over dehydrate the sample. In other words, you dehydrate it and you don't put water back in, it's gone as well. And so here shows many of the residues, there's more of them, where this peak is eliminated in blue or diminished in red. So because so many of mutations cause the same functional group, to the same mode to disappear from the spectrum, the way we explain it is this. We say that there's a, there's a carboxylate group somewhere, we're not sure which one it is, that senses the charge build up on the cluster during the S1 to S2 transition, and its pKa decreases. And it must sense it through a network of hydrogen bonds because if you take out too many water molecules or mutate that residue or this residue or this residue or any of these others, that functional group, that carboxylate doesn't sense the change and its pKa doesn't change and so you don't see a peak. Or it senses it much less effectively and the peak doesn't change as much. So what we have is evidence for an extensive network of hydrogen bonds extending over 20 angstroms across the manganese cluster by looking at this carbonyl stretching frequency. There's actually aspartate, asparagine 298 way up here, so it's more than 20 angstroms now. If you look at the positive feature in the S3 minus S2 spectrum, we see other functional, other residues, other mutations, uh, eliminates or, uh, or perturbs that mode as well. And so again, this evidence for extensive networks of hydrogen bonds around the manganese cluster, as you'd expect looking at the, and the structures. Although, of course, some of these, some of these uh, networks may exist only transiently. Um, right. I think I'd be going the wrong way here. Right, and so what we also find is, and many mutations, uh, well, not many, but D61 or this triad down here, the efficiency of the S3 to S0 transition is sharply diminished. So we, like many others, have argued that there's a dominant proton egress pathway that's functional during the S3 to S0 transition with the protons going via the chloride D61 out this way. And one thing we're trying to understand is, is, this is, is there a different dominant proton transfer pathway or, or functioning during the S2 to S3 transition? Kumin Nikuchi has proposed that, and I think Holger proposed that as well. All right, well, let me focus now on something more recent we've been doing, and that is looking at water molecules directly. We can look at the weakly bonded OH stretching modes of water molecules. These are water molecules hydrogen bonded to amino acids or the chloride, or strongly hydrogen bonded water molecules. This is from a review of Noguchi. Uh, so you can see features of weakly bonded OH stretching modes here. Water strongly stretching modes give you these strong features. Let me focus here on the weakly hydrogen bonded OH stretching modes. This is what you see in Synecocystis. And what you see um, are mostly negative features. Negative feature there. Now, are these water? Yes, because they shift about 950 wave numbers in D2O. And they shift 10 or 12 wave numbers in O18 water and they shift further if you have O18 D to O. You notice the peaks are almost all negative. What we believe that means is that we have water molecules whose weak hydrogen bonding becomes stronger during the S state transitions and then the modes shift over to under bulk water when we can't see them. 
the other possibility is they simply deprotonate. Well, what we've noticed is that there are many mutations where these features, particularly in the S2 minus S1 spectrum, are altered. So here's D61A, the minus peak at 3663 disappears, this positive feature at 3617, that also disappears. And here are a number of other mutants, the same features, not always the same features, but pretty much the same features are altered. And in fact, basically any mutation we make, uh, here, here's the manganese cluster, here's the chloride, D6, D2, lysine 317, ligands of the chloride, D61, D asparagine 298, YZ, almost any of these mutations uh, cause similar changes in the spectrum. Now, a couple years ago, Takumi Noguchi did another QMM analysis and concluded that the water molecules in this network, like this diamond water molecule network uh, structure near YZ, these water molecules are all highly coupled. The OH blending modes are all highly coupled, and so that stands the reason that if you make a mutation anywhere in this, in this um, network, you're probably going to see similar changes. So what we, we do see that, so what we have is you know, experimental evidence, again, that there's an extensive network of hydrogen bonds in the environment of the manganese cluster, which we can see in around 3,600 wave numbers. Now let me switch to this very broad feature of strongly hydrogen bonded water molecules. In the S1, S2 minus S1 spectrum, you see a broad feature with these peaks on top of it. Those are attributed to uh, aliphatic groups and uh, uh, histidine modes and their, their Fermi resonance overtones. But what I'm interested in is this very broad feature, which disappears in D2O. And in the other transitions, so this peak is around uh, 3,000, 28, 2,900 wave numbers. And the other S phase transition is about 2,500 wave numbers. Again, it disappears in D2O. This is what it looks like in our strains, and it consists of 6803. Here's the broad features of aliphatics, but it's this broad feature here that I'm interested in, these broad features as well. Now, in some mutants, like these 170H, there's no change, right? no change at all. But we have others, like D61, where this broad feature is totally eliminated. This is actually the only mutant we've made where it's totally eliminated. In fact, this, in D2O, it's eliminated as well because it's completely shifted. But in this mutant, it's eliminated. But we have a couple of other mutants and just a couple of other where it's perturbed. So some of the feature, some of the broadness here is, seems to be downshifted. And so the only residues, the only mutations that seem to cause changes to the broad feature in the S2 minus S1 spectrum are clustered down here. D61 totally eliminates that broad feature. These residues here perturb it. And again, I go back to Takumi Noguchi's QMMM analysis, and he concluded that although the water molecules are coupled, it's W1 and W2, the two water ligands of the dangling manganese 4, that dominate this broad feature. And in fact, our data seem to corroborate that, corroborate that because D61, the hydrogen bond in W1, eliminates it, and only re residues that are sort of in the vicinity cause perturbations. But as you go further away, you don't see these perturbations. Let me now switch to another mode. We'd like to look at HOH bending modes. The problem is in a very congested region of the spectrum. So again, following Takumi Noguchi, he first looked at DOD bending modes because they're in a region of the spectrum where you don't see much of anything else. These peaks are extremely weak. So to see them, we look at the difference between D2O and O18D2O. Now, if you have one water molecule's bending mode shift, you should see four peaks because you have two D2O and two O18D2O. And in Elongatus, he sees six to eight peaks. We also see six or eight peaks in Seneca cystis. And what we conclude from this is the following. If you look, these main features here oscillate, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative, and so on. The conclusion he drew and we draw as well is there's at least two water molecules whose bending modes change reversibly as you go through this cycle. Now, of course, some of these four four peaks from each of them, well, they, oh, they will um, overlap and cancel out, but there must be at least two water molecules whose bending modes change reversibly as you go through the S-state cycle. Which ones are they? Well, the first mutation we looked at was D61, and you can see that three of these main features vanish. So we conclude that one of these water molecules 
whose bending modes change reversely as they go through the S8 cycle is coupled to D61 right here. In fact, it's probably W1. In fact, maybe W1 is missing in this mutant. We don't know. Um, but we want to know what are the other ones. What other water molecules are there? Now, I want to focus on this feature right there. There's a negative peak in the S3 minus S2 spectrum that does not have a positive peak anywhere else. And Noguchi first saw this in 2008. Well, this is a water molecule whose DOD bending mode disappears in the S2 to S3 transition. In other words, it deprotonates. Well, what water molecule deprotonates during the S2 to S3 transition? We know we've had lots of discussion here in the S2 state. We have to do configurations in equilibrium. And during the S2 to S3 transition, a water molecule deprotonates and inserts itself between manganese 1 and 4 next to O5. We see that in the FTIR. This is peak right there. Now, which one is it? Well, we first looked at, uh, so well, where, which, which, where is it coming from? And there are two models in the literature right now, one of which is the water molecule that inserts itself is W2. It's coming from the manganese 4. It's replaced by WX. This is the carousel model of Rudvig and Batista. Uh, as you heard, some of us favor the pivot model from the Menheim group, where we go through a trigonal bipyrital intermediate is rather than have an extra water molecule bound. But whether you like the pivot model or the carousel model, the same thing happens. W2 moves and inserts itself and is replaced by Wx, which is hydrogen bond to O4. The competing model is proposed by Yamaguchi and co-workers and Vila over there, that the water is coming from W3, from the calcium, and is replaced by W5, which is a water molecule that's hydrogen bonded to W3 and W2. Can we determine which is which using FTIR? Well, we first decided we would look at strontium because there's a nice crystal structure by Professor Shen at 2.1 angstroms of strontium. And if you look at it, really the only water molecules changing the structure are the ligands to the strontium and calcium, W3 and W4. And there are a number of computational studies. This is from Batista's group showing calcium strontium W3 and W4, the ligands of the calcium change, and W5 changes as well. So we wanted to look at strontium exchange because there's a, the changes to water molecules are limited to at most three water molecules. So it should be easier to try to interpret these data. So what we look at when we look at strontium is first, these water molecules that change reversibly during the S8 cycle don't seem to be affected. But this negative feature corresponding to the deprotonated water is altered. I'll blow that up here. The peak is eliminated. It's probably shifted underneath that, eliminating that. So strontium exchange eliminates, alters the water molecule that deprotonates. Okay? This would is more easily explained by saying it is the water molecule on the calcium that it turns itself, deprotonates and inserts itself next to O5 during the S2 to S3 transition. Well, this Calcium, this water molecule is probably replaced by W5. So in fact, the peak we're seeing might be that of W5. Well, if you look in the structure, valine 185 is near W5. And so we actually we have been looking at valine 185 N. That's the mutation first made by Rob Burnout. And so when we look at that mutation, first we see um, the two main features, these two big peaks that are eliminated by D61. They're not altered. There's slight perturbations here, but the big perturbation is the same mode that disappears with strontium is perturbed also in this daily mutant. So again, this is easier to explain by saying that the water molecule that deprotonates and inserts itself between manganese 1 and 4 is the calcium in W3, and it's replaced by W5. But of course, is the competing model, right? And so we're looking, and so Wx here, hydrogen bonded to O4, is hydrogen bonded to serine 169. So what we're trying to do now is look at the DOD bending modes in the serine 169 alanine mutants, because if that same feature disappears, well, then everything's a lot more coupled than we think. If it doesn't disappear, this would again argue in favor of W3 being inserted. So, that's what we've been doing uh, in my group, using infrared spectroscopy to probe hydrogen bond networks. We're now getting into time resolved <laughs> measurements with Holger Dow. We just started that uh, pretty recently. The people who've done that work in my laboratory, 
Uh, Christopher Kim has recorded most of the recent FTIR data, including spectra after spectra after spectra of D2O minus O18 D2O, because these are so tiny we have to really do a lot of signal averaging. Rachel Service recorded spectra before him. And Nguyen is my longtime technician who generates the mutations and maintains our extensive mutation collection. We have a long standing collaboration with Chanko Yano and Biddle Duchandra at LBL, long standing collaboration with Dave Britt and co workers at Davis, and with Gary Brig, Gary Bredvig and co workers at Yale, collaboration with Rob Burnap, and more recently now, Holger Dow and his colleagues with Time Result Infrared Studies. I'm funded by the Department of Energy, and thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, Rick, as we move through the S-state cycle and you come to S3, uh, this has uh, now accumulated a lot of charge. The high valency states become extremely oxidizing mm -hmm. and even a positive charge because at one place we've not taken an electron or not a proton. So this is, uh, now you would expect any uh, mobile water molecules, for example, to respond to that new coulombic environment. Yeah, you would, it would be unreasonable not to think there would be movements of things around when you go from all the way from S1 to S3. Um, uh, would you agree with that? And two, uh, uh, that if we're going to use XFEL to try to understand the actual pathway of OO bond formation, we will have to deal with that background noise of things moving around because of Coulombic changes in that cluster. What do you, what do you say about that? Uh, well, first I'd say that clearly there's a charge that develops on the cluster during the S1 to S2 transition. And that surely is the reason behind this forest of peaks we see. Because we don't, it's not the ligands. I'm sorry, I have to disagree with Noguchi on the, his QMM analysis yes. because we don't see that. And so it's that colomic change, that charge, that's, that charge which we think is causing all this forest of peaks during the S1 to S2 transition, some of which, of course, isn't just by Coulombic, but affecting the hydrogen bonding as well. Yeah. In the S2 to S3 transition, there's a deprotonation event, so there's no charge that builds up on the cluster. Yeah. So presumably, this forest of peak we're seeing there has to do more with the structural perturbations that take place during the S2 to S3 transition. Let me go to S3. Well, that's the S2 to S3. Yeah, but what the point was, there's going to be quite a lot of perturbations in the structure because this charge buildup must be, mustn't it? Uh, which well, there's a deprotonation event so that there isn't a charge buildup on the cluster. You might, might so the, the charge buildup is S1, very, S2. Very oxidizing. Yes, but there isn't charge built up on no, the cluster. No, 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 because of the, of the one charge buildup. The deprotonation yeah. takes place. Okay, all right. So can I come back to your very nice data on the protonated carboxylic acid region? Yes. Um, uh, two questions, really. What, one, because, because they're signals of a protonated <coughs> carboxylic acid, can you identify from PK predictions which protonate, which amino acid it should be? Because you must have a fairly limited number with a predicted very high PK. But, but my second question as well, which is somewhat related, is can you, uh, are you able to tell the difference between a deprotonation causing you a trough or a protonation causing you a peak yeah. versus an environmental change which gives you a polarity change and therefore an extinction coefficient change rather than a uh, protonation change? Good. Well, we think, well, at least the first order, if there's a change in the environment, the peak would shift and you'd get a derivative, which we see in S0, S1. So, the fact that we only see a trough oh, right. yeah. would mean extinction coefficient change or PKA uh, decrease, yeah. PKA increase. I yeah. don't think we could eliminate the possibility of just the extinction coefficient change, but then why is it exactly in the same place as opposed to being slightly shifted in frequency? Yeah, but, but, but we have exactly that difficulty ah. in analysis of... Okay. Uh, it's, uh, well, I'm we're trying following to behind it. you. You guys are the experts right. on this. Right. So. <laughs> if you do a... PH dependency, can you, one way to get at it, I guess, is if you're lucky enough to have a PK which are accessible um, in the pH range you can use, you could distinguish those things. I see. So. We haven't done any pH. 
Uh, can I ask a question? You um, mentioned um, that uh, mutation and a charge, the one residue senses a charge in the center. Uh, well, yes. Uh, my question is, is it the opposite also true that once you mutate another charge into this position, that the electron transport in the center is affected? If one senses a charge in, in one position, mm -hmm. the other, the opposite should be true. Did you observe this? Uh, okay. No, I guess not. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. In other words, your mutation of E3189 to K or to R and to Q gave the same change, even though one might be. And the change, of course, was nothing in the FTR mid-frequency. So, I'm of course very pleased that your data is, is consistent with something, something we, we suggested, but uh, I just wanted to, to uh, if you could clarify, so uh, we suggested that, that what are three deprotonations, so the proton acceptor of that could in principle be, be D61, is, is that, did I understand you correctly, that, there, uh, that you also see a shift protonation of, of D61 linked to deprotonation of, for example, then water tree? We, I wouldn't say I can eliminate it specifically to D61. All I would say here is that a, a residue, a water molecule deprotonates. I don't know where it goes to. And that water molecule deprotonates is specifically perturbed when calcium is replaced by strontium. Yeah, and but you have the mu calcium strontium only affects about three water molecules, so W three seems to be a good one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, so professor, here, here, uh, you, uh, you suggested that calcium bond W three moving to toward uh, magnesium four and as a sub substrates. Uh, so, uh, uh, do we have uh, a strong evidence that? argue against uh, the calcium, uh, calcium water body model? Uh, well, I'm sure Gary would say yes, but, <laughs> but I don't know. From our data, I would only say that right now the water molecule deprotonates and moves. And if Stenburn's model is right, and O5 is one substrate, this would be the second substrate. It would be W3 on the calcium. Now, I'm qualifying that because I want to check and see spirits uh, serine 169, which is hydrogen bonds WX. Because if that also affects the change, then we really can't make a statement. But if it doesn't, then we would argue that we, right now we have evidence that it's W3. The question is, if we now do the test of WX, would that support the W2 model? Do you understand what I, what, what I mean by that? So right now our evidence is in favor of W3. To say if that's the substrate W3 from the calcium ion, that's the easiest way of explaining the data we have. The question is, what happens when we look at WX, or which would be testing the, the opposite model? And so until I've done that test, I wouldn't be definitive on what I'm stating here, except our data to date right now would favor W3. Okay, great. Beautiful work.